Okay, welcome back folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. Uh, we're shifting gears a little bit this afternoon. We're working on a, a couple of uh, one section in particular of S3. We do not physically have the bill. It is in House Judiciary. We're doing a drive, what's called a drive by in that we are just uh, looking at a couple sections in the bill and making our recommendations to House, Correct uh, House Judiciary Committee on behalf of our committee. So this afternoon, we're gonna be looking at section five. And if, if that goes really, really quick, and maybe, maybe we could do just like a quick 30,000 foot look at maybe section six, if we have time. But we're gonna schedule more time next week for section six, which is the forensic unit with all the players. So I don't know if it's Commissioner Baker wants to start or uh, Morning Fox. Uh, we, section five asks for um, an inventory of an inventory and an evaluation of the mental health services that are provided when someone is in uh, corrections. And we, we, this committee, did quite a bit of work on working with DMH and DOC four years ago, I want to say, um, on really developing, helping them develop an MOU for services that would be provided um, within DOC when there's folks with mental health issues or even the SFI folks. So um, we have also a new health contractor Vital Core that we now contract with to provide our medical services and our mental health services. So um, I think part of the questions that we really need to address in section five is what with the inventory, is it possible to do the inventory and the time frame for that and what the inventory and evaluation would encompass. So is it Commissioner Baker that goes first or yes, okay. Welcome, Commissioner. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. For the record, I'm James Baker. I'm the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. And uh, thank you for uh, your time. I know you had a busy day here. Mm -hmm. Look, I, from, from Corrections' standpoint, I, I'm on Section 5 of S3, we don't, we don't have a, a lot to add. We're not opposed to um, doing this work of the inventory and doing some comparison of about what we provide for services. We actually think it, uh, it will be uh, healthy and helpful. Um, so we, we don't have an issue with the language about what's being required for us to do from our part. I don't, I mean, um, I think uh, the deputy commissioner uh, from mental health will um, weigh in on mental health. But from our standpoint, um, we don't have an issue doing that. The one concern we have, and uh, I have um, sent to House Judiciary um, a message because um, I didn't get a chance to testify today there because they ran out of time. We're looking for a little bit of an extension on the time of the report back. Um, as the legislature's um, going through, we've got several reports that we're gonna end up working on again and um, trying to manage those become challenging. This one could take a little bit of work in the sense of inventorying the services, working with vital core, working with uh, mental health and reporting back. So we're, we're asking for, uh, you know, ideally it'd be a 12 month period um, extension from that November 1st, I believe is, uh, is the date, yes, uh -huh. November 1st. Um, we, we would ask for uh, a little bit more time on that. You know, by the time the bill passes and gets out, it's gonna be June. And, you know, that literally leaves us about four and a half, five months to do the work through the summer months, which is a challenging time for everybody because of vacations. So when you ask for like a 12 month, was that, would that be 12 months from like June and July or is it 12 months from now? I'm just I, trying to get a feel. Uh, I, I'd be good with 12 months from now, Madam Chair. So that would be in April. So that doesn't leave much time if there's any legislative work that needs to be done. Okay, question. So that, 
That's yep. where corrections is on, on, on uh, section five. Okay. And let's go to Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner DMH. And um, so if you could identify yourself for the record as well, Morning. Yeah, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for giving us a few moments to uh, discuss this. Um, as Commissioner Baker mentioned, um, this is a, aside from other studies and things going on, uh, this is an important study. Um, and I think it's just coming at, a, at a, uh, an, aus an auspicious time uh, in regards to pandemic and pandemic winding down and how everything is changing and how we operate and reshifting back. Uh, and so I think given some of those complexities as well as making sure that we do a good evaluation of what, you know, getting the, the sense of the inventory of all the services going on and then being able to really have a good comparison of the, the work in the community as that's the, the charge of uh, part of this study is to ensure that we're uh, taking a look at uh, services available in the, in the community um, as well as uh, the functioning and uh, effectiveness of the, the MOU. Um, and so I would agree with Commissioner Baker that uh, just having a, a about a four and a half, five month time frame uh, to, to do that, uh, I think would, would result in a subpar evaluation. Um, so, you know, we, we were in support of, of the request for, for an uh, extended period of time. Uh, I, I understand that it, it would come mid session if we were to go for a year from now, uh, next year. Um, however, uh, I think this committee and others would prefer to have a thorough and valuable assessment done um, than a more timely assessment that's not as thorough or complete. So I'm just thinking through a legislative session and where you are between the mid-March and mid-April. Would mid-March be workable for folks instead of mid-April? Or is that too tight a time frame? Or maybe a draft report by mid-March, or is that still too much? I don't know. I'm just I just know at the end of middle middle of April, we only got have about a month left of a session, which is a little difficult. You know, Matt, yeah, I'm I, open. I'm just trying to put some options out there. And, and I, I as as the deputy commissioner said, I, I hear your concerns. I think mid-March is better than November. Um, so I think we could work with, you know, uh, with the committees to do that. It's just as um, the deputy commissioner said, besides going in the summer, you know, we're, we're in the planning process now of coming out of the pandemic. And that's going to take a lot of resources over the summer to, to uh, orchestra us getting back to whatever the new normal is going to look like. So any amount of time that we can get, I think is going to be beneficial. Because as the deputy commissioner said, I, and I said this in the beginning, I think this is an opportunity for us to take a good look, uh, provides us that opportunity, but I want to make sure it's just not a matter of giving you a report back for sake of giving you a report back. <clears throat> right. So we had some questions. Karen, you had your hand up and it's down. So are you okay? Now I have a question. I okay. changed Karen for some and reason. then Sarah. I'm just automatically going to go to you. <laughs> um, thank you both. And this is this question is to help myself understand things too. I'm wondering if each of you could share your kind of perspective or understanding of why this assessment is needed, the inventory and then the assessment on it. I'm trying to understand the big picture. And so I think it would be helpful to have each of your perspectives. I think to begin with, the, not to not to throw the deputy commissioner under the bus here, but I think he may. I think he, from my conversations with him, he may have a, a better understanding of the history, and then I can weigh in from corrections standpoint. If that's okay. It's all yours, morning. <laughs> I am thankful to the commissioner for this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> we were there with you too, morning on the right. History. No, and this this pre existed in. Uh, uh, an original iteration of this bill from
from the past biennium, which was actually uh, S183. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I think this this piece of the, the legislation was, was put in, um, can't remember exactly who was the driving force, but I think there's, there's always concerns about, you know, how are services in, in contained environments, uh, like a correctional setting, uh, how do those compare to uh, the services that uh, individuals like ourselves may access out in the community? And wanting to ensure that uh, uh, the, the access, timeliness, and types of services that any of us could access, so should uh, people who are, are uh, incarcerated. Um, and that they have a right to, the, to access to those, those types of, of services and in a timely fashion. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that plus uh, the fact that uh, there's a, a new healthcare provider within corrections, I think is an opportune time to kind of take an inventory of where things are at, what's changed over the course as the, the new contractor has come in uh, and where things currently stand and what, if any, uh, improvements still need to be made. So Representative Dolan, I, I think that's the history which I didn't have because it preceded me, right? And so from my standpoint, um, I didn't understand the history until I, I met up with the Deputy Commissioner and folks from mental health yesterday um, to prepare for today. And um, from where I stand on this, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. It's exactly what the Deputy Commissioner was talking about there's always this question about how well we're doing with individuals that are incarcerated. And, you know, especially during the pandemic, um, I think this would be a timely opportunity for us to look back, especially in this pandemic environment. You know, we've talked in this committee before about the cho choices we've had to make to keep the facilities clean, to include putting people in quarantine coming into the facilities. You know, and it's no pretty way of saying it, they're isolated. And um, you know, it's, it's not easy. And it's not easy for the staff and it's not easy for the individuals. And so I think it's a timely opportunity for us to work with our contractor, mental health, and really see if we measure up to what the outside standard is, the community standard is, on how we get mental health support to the individuals that are incarcerated. And if it shows that we're not doing what we should be doing, it's our opportunity to to, to fix it instead of waiting for a tragedy to happen. So again, I think um, um, we're fully supportive and be very, very um, supportive of looking at, at the outcomes and figure out how we can even do better. Great, thank you both, I appreciate it. Okay, Sarah. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, thanks. And thank you, um, Deputy Commissioner and Interim Commissioner. Um, it's, I have a couple of questions, but I, the first one is um, if this, the question here is about uh, looking into a, a forensic, the need, potential need for a forensic um, facility. And it's specifically for people here, the way the language is in here is, you Sarah, know, for. So, Sarah, you've kicked over to section six. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe I should wait, wait off. No, I'll hold off on my question then. Um, how many folks, and this, this may be, may not be able to answer this, but I think I'm going to categorize it in terms of SFI, ser seriously functionally impaired, because that's more the definition that's used within corrections. How many, do you know how many folks are in that category at this point at all? Um, <clears throat> I don't know the exact number. A, a few weeks back, I had asked for that number, and I, you know, I'm just going to give a number. Please don't hold me to it. Mm -hmm. But I want to follow it up with a point. And uh, it was somewhere around 35ish. You know, the population is 1234 today. Mm -hmm. um, but preparing for this, I had asked staff um, to kind of give me an update on what's going on in, in this space, and um, and. Uh, you know, what we've done on our own is, is to, to really put a team together that's taking a look at folks um, who fit into that category 
and, and measuring that up against our responsibilities with ADA. And that's a process that's going on right now. There's a team looking at that just to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So I can get you that exact number. Um, I'm just giving you that number off the top of my head. My, my memory may not be what it used to be. and I may not have that number right. I was just curious on that. And I know that we do have a copy of the MOU that um, the committee can take a look at too. And, and that has been in place morning. That was put in place three years ago, two years ago, the MOU three. Yeah, I'd say it's been about three years. I think you're, you're right around that. And just a reminder for the committee too, uh, the uh, SFI designation uh, covers folks, you know, who have uh, mental health or severe, significant mental health impairments, uh, as well as intellectual developmental disabilities uh, and others as well. Um, so, but yeah, you're, I think you're, you're right, Madam Chair, that the MOU has been in place. I helped craft it, <laughs> you know, yeah. probably three or four years ago, somewhere in that framework. Okay. Anything I've been else? Deputy now for about four and a half years. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, I, was, I, I think that was. I think I, my question I was going to ask is actually on this topic. So on MOU. Well, not the MOU, but like you know, if the if there are thirty five people, where are they housed throughout our system, or are they? in our men, are they, whether it's DOC or mental health, like where, where are these people now? So uh, Representative Coffey, they, they would be um, throughout the system, um, but I, I don't, I don't want to give, I am asking, I just text to ask for a report. And so I, I can get back to you on that because I want to be really accurate about that. Um, you know, we do have a focus on mental health in the Springfield facility but folks are throughout our system. So I, I will get, I will get that information to you. So, so it's, it's, so it's from, it sounds like when you say the system, you're sounding like it's the, it's in the correctional system. So they're not in, they're not at the state psychiatric hospital or at the Brattleboro retreat, or I just want to be, make sure that yeah, I'm clear. Remember when you asked me that question, you're asking me who's in my custody. Yeah, no, I went, I went right, for right. both so, of you. So That's, yeah. If they're in my custody, they're in our system, which is the correction system. If they're well, in Commissioner good. Squirrel's custody, I'll let the Deputy Commissioner answer that. And I, I think, uh, Representative Coffey, uh, to, to try to explain a little bit better, the designation of SFI does not in turn mean that they need placement elsewhere. Um, and so, but part of the MOU is that we work together with our partners at DOC should, it, should an individual uh, who's housed within corrections require hospital level of care, whether it be voluntary or involuntary, that we provide uh, facilitation of that, uh, consultation on cases, uh, you know, things of that nature <clears throat> uh, and such. So it may be possible that a person who's designated as SFI at some point during their their incarceration may be hospitalized and may return um you know uh but the designation of sfi does not necessarily mean that they they require uh, outside the walls treatment if you will okay thank you uh scott and then marcia not sure if this is the right time to ask this but i'm curious what services are provided to people with that designation within the correction system. And, and how are, are they integrated with the rest of the population? Are they segregated? You know, I, I'm, I'm just curious about the whole thing. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's hard to say, are they, because some cases, no, some cases, yes. Right, depending. Uh -huh. um, with, with our medical contract, and again, I'll get you the, the, uh, the, the specific language. But with our medical contract with Centurion, um, we, we do, they do provide um, mental health on-site services for individuals. But remember, this is not evaluations. This is more about support at the clinical level, right? Just checking in on people and uh, checking in on, on their welfare when it comes to their behavioral health. If we are aware of people that have underlying issues such as 
depression, um, you know, that steps up how we follow their case internally, just like we would follow their case with medical. Um, we would follow their case as a result of that um, with the medical team in conjunction with the mental health workers that work under the um, vital court contract. Okay. I get, I, yeah, I, I, get, I guess I'm just wondering whether um, we're trying to sort of help, help these folks get better or, or is it just a maintenance kind of situation or um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the degree to which um, a correctional system is, 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 is actually a, a, a place for housing folks who are, who, um, you know, who, ha who have, who have th these kinds of issues and, 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 and related issues, you know, uh, trauma, uh, substance, substance use, you know, all of those things that, um, that uh, make people run afoul of the law and, and, and do bad things. But, and, and, but then, anyway, I'm, I'm not being very coherent about this. Well, I, well you know, I think, I think Representative Campbell, you're describing what the challenges in our system are, right? Yeah, yeah. That um, folks end up in our system with all of those. And we try our level best to provide the services to them. And, you know, and when I was preparing for this yesterday with, with you know, Deputy Commissioner Fox, you know, we talked about the fact that if you're if you're seeking out some type of mental health support in the community, you may wait four weeks, five weeks to get an appointment. If you put a slip in inside our system that you want to see somebody, um, you're not waiting four or five weeks. Now, I'm not going to promise you're going to see them within an hour, but you know, we we try very hard to get those services there. And many of the folks that we end up with, I think this is why this, I think this is why the report is going to be helpful. Yeah, especially with a new contract to validate what I'm being told and to validate what I think about the level of support we give to those individuals who have underlying issues like that. But many of the folks that come into our custody do in fact um, need that kind of support. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, Marsha. Uh, I just want to address something to the Commissioner Baker, and it really has nothing to do with this, but I just want to thank him on one thing, and that's for the article in Digger today that expressed how many people refuse to get shots, because I've been getting emails, and now I have something to throw back at them, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. you know, Representative Martell, I always appreciate your support in these hearings. <laughs> it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the best media day yesterday, but um, I appreciate that feedback. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, I think one thing for the committee and commissioner and deputy commissioner, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I know in past testimony that we have received whenever we've been dealing with the SFI population, mental health issues, when someone who is incarcerated reaches an acuity level um, that goes beyond what DOC can handle there is an agreement with the Department of Mental Health that the person can be transferred to the state hospital in Berlin. And, and that, that is there um, in order for the person to be stabilized. And once they're stabilized, then they do go back to the correctional facility. So that may happen a couple, three times a year. That was our testimony a few years ago. I don't know if that's still the case, but um, I'm going to leave it at that. So is that still the case that that does happen? Yeah. Yes, it is. It's it's not necessarily as straightforward. There's you know some some bit of complexities to it, um, but but you're basically that's that's the correct uh, kind of pathway, if you will. Uh, you know. If, DOC is working with an individual they may bring to us at, at DMH um, that they have an individual that they think meets criteria for voluntary or involuntary hospitalization. And so we'll help facilitate those assessments, those evaluations for that level of care need. Um, and then once that's confirmed, then we again will help facilitate either admission to the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, the Brattleboro Retreat, or, or another inpatient facility. Um, and then you're exactly right. Uh, treatment occurs, 
and then the person is stabilized. And then at that point, um, they would return back to corrections, assuming that they still had, you know, uh, Department of Corrections connection. Uh, we have had times where, you know, people's sentence, you know, finishes while they're hospitalized and then they discharge from our facility as opposed to from a correctional facility, uh, you know, that, that type of, uh, of timing. But your, your Madam Chair is, is exactly right in the, the general concept of how that works. And refresh my memory, when they do move to uh, either the psychiatric hosp care hospital in Berlin or the retreat, are they under dual custody in terms of they're still under DOC custody, but now they're also under mental health or is it just under mental health? Well, I think it, it depends on, on uh, what status they go to the hospital. Uh, if they go voluntarily, then they still have that, that sole uh, custody connection to DOC. If they go involuntarily um, and they still have that corrections connection, then they kind of have that dual status. And then we, like I said, we've had that time where the DOC connection may end as someone's, you know, sentence wraps up or something of that sort, and then they'd be under the sole custody of the of the, the commissioner of DMH. You know, Madam Chair, something else I want to add: short of someone moving from a correctional facility to a mental health facility, you know, the MOU. I mean, there's a lot of conversation that goes back and forth between us and mental health on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, you all know I'm fairly new. I've been using this excuse now for 15 months, right? I'm new, but I'm, I'm running out of that excuse. I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. But there's a lot of conversation that goes on on individual cases that we rely on mental health um, expertise to help us understand how to manage uh, a particular situation. And one thing, Commissioner, too, when you're getting the numbers for how many folks for the SFI, it would be good to see how many of those are sentenced and how many are detainees. Okay. That might be helpful as well. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. that sort of now slides us in a little bit into S, uh, section six, which deals with a forensic care working group, which includes the Department of Mental Health and DOC. And I wanna do a deeper dive into this next week but while you're both here, if you've got a few minutes, I don't know if you want to weigh in just real quickly. I don't even know how to start it because one, one place we need to start as a committee is understanding what a forensic unit is. And I know we had Katie McClinn in yesterday, our legal staff, our lawyer, talking that there's two, <clears throat> two ways of getting into a forensic. One is through the civil procedure and the other one's through the criminal procedure. Um, and, and, or through the courts, not the criminal, but through the courts. <clears throat> and I think we just need some basic understanding of when we're talking about the forensic care here in section six, which path are people coming in on? Are they coming through, um, through the civil path or are they coming through the courts? Um, so I don't know. That's where I think I want to start. Something very, very basic. If you can help us. Sure. Uh, um, I'm a little confused at the at the comment that uh, someone comes into the forensic system through civil or or through that that process. Uh, forensic mental health is about people who are involved in the criminal justice system, uh, and so what we're talking about forensic. There's there's a couple of of places of forensic that someone might. If we're talking about who would go to a forensic facility. I think there's a couple of options of how we might look at that. Uh, and this is part of what I think the study needs to, to determine. One is when the court orders uh, competency and sanity evaluations, um, uh, is that the location where those evaluations can happen? Um, also, uh, when someone is uh, a detainee or serving a sentence within corrections uh, and need psychiatric hospitalization, would that be in a forensic facility? 
or would that be at a, a general psychiatric hospital? Again, I think these are some of the things that need to be discussed at the, the work group. Uh, one of the things that we run into uh, at the Department of Mental Health is whenever we have an individual uh, who's been ordered hospitalized through the courts uh, that is criminally justice involved, uh, we need to treat their mental illness. And uh, if someone's been adjudicated as not competent to stand trial or been adjudicated as not guilty by reason of insanity, because of those adjudications, they, they can't serve in a correctional setting. Uh, and the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and in fact, all of our psychiatric hospitals in Vermont are uh, CMS certified and Joint Commission accredited, uh, which means that we have to follow the conditions of participation in order to receive the federal funding that helps pay for these institutions, for these facilities. The Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital uh, has an operating budget of over $20 million a year, uh, most of which is Medicaid, uh, federal dollars. Uh, the issue with that is that part of the conditions of participation to receive Medicaid funding is that individuals who receive care uh, at a place like the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital have to only be there for psychiatric care. And so once treated and are seen as stabilized and no longer needing hospital level of care, it is incumbent upon the department to discharge them. And then from a practical standpoint, we then run into the issue of, uh, let's say as an example, someone is alleged to have committed a extremely violent crime uh, and they're found not guilty by reason of insanity or not competent to stand trial. We treat them and let's say six months later, they're doing well enough that they've stabilized they're on medication, clear uh, or clearer, uh, but no longer need hospital level of care. I would dare say that I think there's there would be concern if then we turn around to say, well, we now have to discharge them. And so Vermont is an outlier when it comes to the concept of having a forensic facility that can monitor not only mental health needs, but public safety needs. Uh, there's really only a, a small handful of states um, that I can probably count on one hand that do not have a general funded uh, facility uh, for these types of cases. Uh, but if we were to continue to hospitalize an individual after they no longer meet the kind of criteria that CMS lays out for need for hospitalization, we run the risk of losing the funding either partial or completely uh, for, that, for that facility. And so this has been something that I've testified on a number of times and I'm quite passionate about that. Uh, one thing that Vermont is lacking is the concept of a facility that can bridge the gap of both mental health needs as well as public safety. Um, you know, I, my past experience, aside from my eight years at the department here and 25 years in mental health, uh, a half dozen of those years, I worked uh, uh, as a managing director at Bridgewater State Hospital in Massachusetts, uh, which is a forensic facility of sorts. Uh, not that in any way, shape or form, I am looking to uh, mirror or bring a Bridgewater-like facility here, but it's just an example of, that other states have uh, this type of facility to bridge that gap. Um, and so that's the, the, the tightrope and, and kind of difficult dance that DMH uh, has when we're talking about uh, forensic cases. So I got a couple questions. So is it also true? Well, I guess I'm gonna ask the second question first. In, in the situation morning that you just spoke about down at Bridgewater, but also maybe up here, how it would play out, under whose jurisdiction would a forensic, and I know that's what this working group would look yep. at, but under whose jurisdiction is it? Would it be DOC or would it be mental health or is it going to be a whole different entity? Who would, because they're not convicted, right? they're not serving out a sentence. 
Um, so whose jurisdiction would it be under? And they're not going to get Medicaid reimbursement because they're not going to be seen as um, in a mental health. They've stabilized. Right. No, you're right. And, you know, Medicaid would look at them. They would fall under Medicaid's definition of inmate. Um, and, you know, Medicaid's definition of inmate, which we're con constantly uh, kind of butting heads with Medicaid on, you know, Medicaid has taken a stance that sometimes where that anyone who uh, is court ordered uh, for treatment, they consider an inmate. Uh, so that could even be, you know, civil uh, folks, uh, you know, as you've mentioned. And so that's, that's been an ongoing, you know, negotiation slash discussion with CMS. Uh, from my research and from my work experience, uh, many states, they, they do it differently. Some it's run by the, their, the state's Department of Mental Health. Some it's run by Department of Correction, and frequently it's it's kind of a joint effort uh, between those two two entities. Again, because you have the public safety uh, concerns, but you also have the mental health needs of of the individuals. Um, and so, different states have different things. There are some states that have uh, instead of you know the doctor deciding this person no longer needs to be here, and so we're going to discharge, that they have a a board uh, made up of psychiatrists, um, uh, lawyers, uh, 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 victims advocates, and others uh, similar to what might make up a, uh, a parole board uh, to make decisions on when a person is discharged and to what type of services. Uh, and so these are the types of things that, that uh, it's my hope uh, that, that that's what we really delve into into the, uh, the forensic uh, study group. Uh, and I'll put my early plug in now uh, for more time uh, that it's, you know, shall start by August 1 and shall have a report by November 1. Uh, I think just, just to talk about a facility, we're going to need more time, let alone competency restoration programs, let alone uh, um, ONH notifications and, and other pieces and, and such like that. And so I'm putting in my early plug, and I know we'll talk about it next week, but I'll put in my early plug now that we're gonna need some significant time. Again, I don't think this committee, nor will we do Vermonters any justice by doing you know, a, a half-hearted half evaluation uh, just to meet a timeline. Mm -hmm. So the other issue that was percolating out there, I believe a couple of years ago, because uh, some cases were sort of dismissed down at the state's attorney's level for folks that uh, there were two or three cases in particular thinking they wouldn't have, wouldn't be able to prosecute either because the person could be deemed insane at the time of the crime or incompetent to stand trial at the time of the trial. Those are two separate things. And so then it gets shifted over to mental health and if the person is uh, housed at one of our mental health facilities, either at the psychiatric hospital in Berlin or the retreat, they're under Department of Mental Health. And mental health is not required or able because of HIPAA to notify the public when the person has been stabilized and when they are released. Where if the person is under DOC custody DOC is required to notify the victims, the public. There's more access to where that person is being housed and for how long than there is in the mental health world. And that's another rub here, correct? Yes, and I think that's earlier sections of S3 address a lot of that. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking at an individual that gets committed to the Department of Mental Health as incompetent to stand trial, um, that uh, as long as the charges remain and they are not dismissed, uh, that should the department seek to discharge that individual from its custody or from a secure setting, that we would notify the state's attorney uh, that was prosecuting the case and or attorney general if they're the ones prosecuting this, the case so that uh, victims can be notified uh, you know, that uh, a person is going to be discharging from a secure setting or discharging from custody altogether. Uh, 
Uh, it would also include uh, for individuals who are adjudicated as not guilty by reason of insanity uh, that we would make that same uh, notification. And that's not going against HIPAA or anything? It's, and that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we've done a lot, of, a lot of work, ledge council, our own council, um, as long as there's uh, criminal charges that remain open, we think we're good. Many other states have similar laws uh, requiring just that type of notification, and it has not yet to this day been challenged uh, by, the, by the federal courts at all uh, as a violation of HIPAA. And so based on how other courts have been doing, other states have been doing it in other jurisdictions, uh, we feel fairly comfortable uh, being able to go forward with that. And the, and the folks who are found not guilty by reason of insanity, that's really such a small number uh, of individuals in how kind of the courts work here in Vermont uh, that we really don't, don't think so. Plus the amount of information that we're giving is very minimal. It's really just enough for people to know the person is being discharged and that they're no longer in a secure uh, setting. Uh, the other provision that uh, most folks have testified about concerns with HIPAA is for those who have been placed on order of non-hospitalization as a result of being found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity, and that the, the courts would be notified uh, if someone was not in compliance with that order. Uh, that is fraught with HIPAA concerns, because now you're starting to talk about actual treatment and the treatment that people are, are engaging in and what they're doing. It creates a conflict between the treatment providers and those they're trying to provide treatment with as kind of being, you know, almost like a, you know, a probation officer, if you will, you know, and a huge aspect of uh, what really helps engage a, an individual in treatment is that they build a trusting therapeutic relationship. And it's really difficult to have that relationship be sustained if, you know, you missed an appointment yesterday. saying, all right, well, we've got to call the courts, um, you know, that kind of thing. Even though an individual may be doing well, but circumstances happen, um, people miss a dose of a medication or miss an appointment. Uh, and so that's why we, uh, my, the Department of Mental Health, as well as Disability Rights Vermont, uh, as well as uh, state's attorneys and others are all suggesting that that ONH language uh, be struck from uh, the bill uh, and just be included as part of the study to see if we can do that and if so, how. Okay. Questions from the committee? Alice, I've got a question. Mary. Yep. Mary. Yes. Um, I guess I would put the question out to um, any of you that are testifying, and I'm sorry that I was late coming back into the meeting. I had another meeting I had to be at. Um, but why do you think we are, are only one of three states in the country that does not have a forensic uh, unit? My, my honest opinion um, is that uh, it's, 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 it's a costly endeavor. It's general fund money. Um, you know, even if we're talking about a fairly small facility, um, whether it's repurposing of an old, old older facility or building a new one, there's going to be that cost, you know, the capital uh, cost, which I know this <laughs> committee is, you know, well versed in, but then you have the operating costs. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, a 25 bed facility, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital is a $20 million a year um, uh, over $20 million a year operating cost. Uh, that is not a huge hit to Vermonters because the primary bulk of that is paid for by Medicaid. A forensic facility, we won't be able to get that Medicaid match. And so I think the reality is it's, it's, a, dollar, it's a dollar thing. Uh, and I think that that's a, a, uh, that's a tough thing to, to swallow. Uh, that's, it's, it's uh, beyond, it's not cheap. Right, no, and understood. Do you, um, and is Jim Baker still with us as well? Yes, he is, Mary. Okay, do you both feel that it is a need for the state, even, you know, considering I do understand the cost of it, but do you both feel that this is a facility that's needed? 
you might want to hold judgment on that until the study comes back. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess uh, I see the deputy commissioner. Oh, I'll, I'll give my answer. My yeah, answer. Go ahead, is, and then I'll follow up with you. Yeah. My answer has been this way for years. Um, that I think Vermont desperately needs uh, a, a, a facility of this nature. Uh, I don't think we need a, you know, necessarily a 25 or 50 bed, you know, large type institution, but I think there's always going to be a handful of individuals uh, that uh, will come into either Commissioner Baker's or, or our systems uh, through the criminal courts. Uh, you know, I want to, to be, be clear, you know, that people with mental illnesses are much more likely to be a victim of a, of a violent offense than to commit one. However, it does happen. People, that can happen. And then I think it's an incumbent upon us as, as the state uh, that we provide good care and uh, with an eye to public safety uh, at the same time. Uh, the system we have currently, we provide that good care and then what? Uh, someone is, is found not guilty by reason of sanity or incompetent to stand trial. Once treated, then what? And so that's that's why I think there needs to be, you know, I've, I've said this on the record before and I'll say it again today, uh, that yes, uh, I think we need this type of, uh, of a facility. I think what's important is who's gonna run it, how it's gonna be run, how big it's going to be, uh, are there facilities and, and buildings that can be repurposed or does it need to be new? All of those kind of questions. Uh, but at least in my mind, I'm going into the study going with the thought that, yes, I think we need something. Uh, what exactly that looks like. I think we need to look at other states, how they're doing it. And what's, what happens in one state doesn't necessarily work here. Uh, you know. Uh, we're, we're another state like other places. We're unique like every other state will say they're unique. Uh, but our laws are different than, than other states and their laws are different than ours. And so we need to be, be thoughtful and mindful of the type of facility, how it gets run, the type of services, uh, and, and how individuals will be treated and how it gets determined, uh, you know, uh, when their release should happen. Uh, I think part of it also is engaging in competency restoration programs uh, because I think people have a right to face, uh, you know, their accusers. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not uncommon that people are found incompetent to stand trial. And at that point, charges get dismissed and, and it's done, um, except in, you know, the most serious of, of, of cases. And so, you know, I think that's a disservice to, to individuals because they don't, they have a right you know, just because someone has a mental illness and is found incompetent to stand trial, they have a right uh, to, to be able to go to court to be able to work on their defense. And whether that's an insanity defense or just a, I didn't do it defense um, and not guilty. I think they have that right. And right now, the way it operates, we don't have a competency restoration program. And so I think that's another part of the study that is really important that influences how uh, a facility like this would work. You know, Representative Morris, yeah, I'm new, but, you know, again, I, I don't, well, and, and that's serious, no. I, obviously, you know, the Deputy Commissioner is uh, well-versed and his knowledge is unbelievable in this area because of his background. And he's a, you know, I, I think uh, the committee ought to listen very closely to his wisdom based on his background. What I'd like to add to this is um, similar to what the Deputy Commissioner just said, is that um, from where I sit being in the system, 45 years and looking at this, it's all of a sudden you get to a point that it's that, like he said, then, then what? And then victims are left hanging. And um, again, the individual has a right. And I also think it's an opportunity based on the little bit I understand about the forensic approach for all of us to learn as much as we can about um, mental health and what benefits would come out of the work that's done there for us to better understand mental health and the stigma that goes with it, and, and especially within the system. So the little bit I've been briefed up on it, the little bit I understand about it, uh, this is in the best interest of everybody um, that some type of forensic process gets put in place 
in order for us to get better in Vermont and treating everyone with the level of dignity, respect, and making sure the justice system works for everybody. And so I, I, that's where I am. And I think to study, you know, corrections, to give a little peek into what I'll talk about next week, corrections is all in on supporting mental health on uh, being part of that study to figure out what's the best step forward for us um, to figure out a forensic piece. Because right now, uh, everybody's frustrated when something bad happens and it just ends. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's a real weakness in the system. And a lot of people start pointing fingers at people and it doesn't serve anybody well as a result of that. Um, so again, my limited knowledge about forensics, that's where I am on the conversation. I appreciate both of your comments. Thank you. So we have another question, Kurt. Yeah, I'm, I have two questions. One, we had Act 78 back in 2017, which required the establishment of a forensic mental health unit um, by July of 2019. I, I don't know what happened with that. That MOU that we was established then was supposed to be temporary and that we were supposed to have a plan for putting together a forensic mental health unit. So I'm trying to figure out what happened to that and why that didn't move forward. I'm also trying to figure out how this relates to the DOC feasibility study, which is supposed to come back and uh, specifically states that subgroups having to do with mental health, it, it's supposed to look into those sub one of the, those as a subgroup and figure out a bed count and what kind of facilities costs might be needed for that. So is this redundant? Are we doing the same thing twice or something we did three years ago? Or are we going to do be in the same mess again where we require something and it doesn't get done? Uh, I think it's a little different, Kurt, because the, the mental health unit that we were talking about with corrections, the folks are there. Um, I don't think they're at the stage where they've been evaluated to be um, incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the crime. There's a real difference there in who you're talking about. What we worked on prior for, for that mental health unit were for folks with SFI or mental health disorders, uh, but they're not at the level of not being able to go through the court system and be adjudicated. That's what I believe is the difference. And I see Morning nodding his head yes. I think for us, we were talking about folks who are in the correctional system. Some of them have sentences they're carrying out. Some of them are detainees. They've been competent to stand trial. They've gone through a trial or they have not been deemed insane at the time of the crime. It's a different so this level must, of mental that health. That wasn't for detainees as well. Somebody, uh, detainee who comes in and has a mental health crisis while under the custody of the Department of Corrections. And this thing that we worked on years ago didn't have to do with getting them the help that they need. There are different, how do I phrase this morning? They're, they're, it's almost a different level of their mental health issues. They're not at the point that they were insane when the crime was committed. And they have not been deemed incompetent to stand trial. That's, those are the two avenues for forensic, is my understanding. And I, my, my memory is a little foggy from, from back then, but I think it was referring to uh, more folks who are, who are sentenced, um, or, but there, there wasn't a competency or sanity question. It's maybe some of that SFI population and providing a more robust, if you will, mental health uh, system within corrections um, and uh, uh, you know I'd have to go back and review it representative Taylor just to be to be clear and to be honest um, but if I remember if we're talking 2017 Please. was this also the the time when we we're we we're also looking at the possibility of standing up uh, another facility and that there was the whole um, different discussions of uh, up in uh, the St. Albans area. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, 
the twelfth uh, bed, the twelfth right. bed forensic. That right. is separate than what we worked on with the MOU right. and looking at the mental health services within DOC. Those that was a whole separate population. It just happened to be part of that campus style project that Secretary Gorbet put on the table. Yeah. It was twelve. I haven't. Bits. I haven't, I haven't, I've tried to, uh, that's why I asked where this other MOU is, because I have one MOU and you're talking about, I gather a different MOU and I'm trying to figure out how these relate together. So are we talking about two separate forensic mental health units, one for people who are in corrections and detain, uh, already sentenced, and then another one for these, for people who are determined to be insane at the time of trial? Or are we talking about one for both? And I think that's, and how that's, I think that's part of what the, the study group will be trying to grapple with. Uh, would it, how are we defining that forensic population? Uh, is it solely for those with competency and sanity issues? Or is it also for uh, those detainees or uh, sentenced individuals who may have a psychiatric crisis uh, requiring hospitalization, and would they also be served at at a, a facility like this as well? I think that's that's the the, the piece to be discussed. Uh, I think that's a part of it. Uh, in some states, uh, again, some states like here, someone who is serving a sentence or is a detainee and requires hospitalization goes to a general psychiatric hospital. Uh, you know, like the state Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, the Brattleboro Retreat, you know, that, that type of thing. In other states, uh, individuals who are uh, detainees or serving a sentence, they would go to a, a forensic facility um, where there's also that, that other population of the folks with incompetence to stand trial or sanity uh, um, adjudications uh, and, and serving it that way. And there's, there's arguments for both sides. Uh, as to why one is better than the other or why one is worse than the other. Um, and I could probably argue myself on both sides uh, for quite some time, because uh, there are there are different points on each side as to why uh, it's, it's, you know, why it might be better to have them go to a general psychiatric hospital. Um, everyone should be treated the same and we should all receive the same services and everyone should have access to, you know, same levels of, of care, uh, others have concerns that you know should should people who are incarcerated uh, be receiving care uh, with you know you uh, or me um, if if we need to be psychiatrically hospitalized, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that some of those types of things uh, are are what what informs those those kind of statewide decisions as to the the actual population to be served in a, in a forensic facility. And I think those are the types of things that the study will, will come out of. I think just even the correctional study, you know, is talking about what's the level of, of services and access. Uh, you know, I think the, the concept is that folks who are serving time or are detained uh, have as good of access as someone in the community uh, should have and types of services, et cetera. Uh, and so if we're truly able to do those things, you know, then the conversation is about, you know, what population should be served at a forensic uh, facility as, as we've been discussing today. Okay, so, so the, the feasibility study, which I gather we might be able to see next week, which should also deal with, at least within the corrections uh, population of forensic needs or forensic mental, mental health needs would inform this group coming up and that would uh, help to make the decision then or is that is that the idea how does this fit in with the feasibility study I, if i can take if i can take this, oh, this piece I, I don't you know representative taylor i don't see us you know I, and again I'm, I'm getting into an area where i'm, I'm not an expert but please make a, a distinction if you got someone in in my custody that has a, is at the level of care that they need to move to a forensic hospital, you can't mix those folks into some type of setting if they're designated, if we have other folks in the system designated SFI. So what I'm looking for in the current feasibility study is creating the proper 
um, space to manage the programming around the folks that we have in the system now that are SFI, not someone that needs that level of care. I, I hope this helps you know, make that distinction. It's not that maybe the study committee working on the forensic piece doesn't come back and make a recommendation. And we'll have time to deal with that because the next step we're talking about right now with the feasibility study is do we put, you know, do we take the 1.5 million over the next two years in the current um, capital budget to make the next move towards what we're going to do with the primary focus on replacing the women's facility. What I'm worried about is we can't lose focus on the women's facility in the feasibility study. I don't think the intent was to be talking about creating forensic um, space inside what we create for new space in, as a result of the feasibility study, if that makes sense. There's a big difference between what, Fox, what, what Deputy Commissioner Fox is describing on the forensic piece, and I know I'm starting to get pretty close outside my expertise. There's a big difference between that and who we have in our population now that we serve. They may be designated SFI, they may not be, but we're providing them mental health services. The current setup of our facilities, I've already said this, are do not render themselves to the type of environment where you should be managing that population. That's what we're talking about when we take a look at the feasibility study. I'm hoping I'm helping you and not confusing you. We may have I a think. better idea of that, Kurt, next Tuesday. We're scheduling Tuesday afternoon, we hope, for the Hawk report. So it may help clarify some of this. Um, is that going to be available before Tuesday for us to look at? They're not sure yet because there's a lot of data um, and there's hope that it might be able to be maybe on Monday, but there's a lot of data that's being assimilated right now. And we are working on having a joint meeting with Senate Institutions Committee next Tuesday afternoon is what we're working on to schedule. Um, okay, just one more, just again, if at all possible, I would like to be able to see the study uh, at least 24 hours before we hear a report on it so that we can, I mean, the, the, the study that came back in Maine was 350 pages, which I'm imagining is similar to this in some states. It's going to be pretty comprehensive and I'd like to have some time to look at it before we're actually going over it in committee, just a request. People are working as hard as they can. So there's no hmm. promise is when it, if it will be available prior or not. And if it's not available prior and we go through the joint meeting, we'll be working on it some more. So it's not gonna be the only time that we'll be looking yeah. at it. Okay, good enough, thanks. So Sarah and I have to scoot out because my carpenter is getting ready to leave. So Sarah's gonna take over for a second and Sarah does have a question. I hope to be right back shortly. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I think this is a question for both of you, Commissioner and um, Deputy Commissioner. I, um, as we're looking at section six in the bill, I'm wondering a couple things are, is this too prescriptive or are there right, the right ingredients in here about what the working group should focus on? I was, one of the things that jumped out to me was a spe the specificity of looking at a program or a model in Connecticut um, where, you know, so I'm wondering if that's a really kind of a broad question. Are there, is this too specific or too limiting or is it the right ingredients or are there things that should be made more open or, uh, or added in? Is my yeah, question. I think from, from DMH's perspective, um, I think it's, it's fine uh, in that sense. And when you're talking about like, you know, is it too prescriptive? You know, I think I've heard some testimony about, you know, it's a little too prescriptive and shouldn't, you know, that could lead, lead to a bias. Uh, if uh, you have things in there, like uh, including the Connecticut's uh, psychiatric security review board, it's fine if that's taken out. Um, that's really not something that, uh, you know, we will look at various models regardless. Uh, and uh, I think that language actually got, got put in, um, 
when we were having some of the early conversations about this bill uh, and just that uh, it was something that we had noted and had been something that we had looked, we had some information on. Uh, and so it was, it was really just part of a conversation, uh, I believe with actually Senator Sears, uh, where it was, you know, yes, we want to look at places like the Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board and what they do, you know, it's a, it's a very different model. They have a similar one to uh, how Oregon does it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we want to look at things like that. And so that language then appeared in, in, in the legislation, mm -hmm. but it's not something we're married to. And if people have concerns about, you know, that type of language and just leaving it a bit more broadly, that's completely fine from our end. Okay. That's, that's, I'm sure there's something terrific in Connecticut, you know, sure. my, my thought without being an expert, but I'm imagining that there are things in other states too, you know, that sure. we'd want to sure. learn from. Earlier today, I testified about, you know, some issues, you know, connected to this bill and was referencing uh, statutes and, and language in uh, the state of Wyoming. And that's not in here, but, you know, that's, you know, so I, I really just feel like we're, it's incumbent upon us to really look at, you know, all the various models that are out there. Um, and if people do have a concern that it seems prescriptive or could lend to, to a bias in, in the assessment and evaluation, then I think we're very comfortable with with that that being that type of line language taken out. And do you think otherwise, like the right ingredients are in here for what you'd want to be looking at? And I, this is either of you could respond. Yeah, no, we've we've been really pretty good with it. You know, I think um, you know the member the members of uh, who would be included in this, you know, I would think, you know, maybe I would want to add like the Vermont Medical Society um, to get, you know, to ensure that we've get, you know, kind of the overall psychiatric community and, and doctor communities input uh, into uh, um, the types of services that, that we'd be looking at in here. Uh, but I think, you know, um, victim services, uh, legal aid, et cetera, uh, all those types of, of organizations, identifying the gaps. Um, we definitely need to look at competency restoration models. And so that's in here. Um, and again, you know, it's fine to take out the, uh, the specific reference to, to Connecticut. Um, but it's as I've, as I've testified today, the need for a facility, who would run the facility, um, what type of uh, structure it would be, number of beds, um, you know, fiscal impact. Uh, and that just says that it should include, but it doesn't limit us. And so uh, I'm not concerned that if there are other uh, areas, appendices, et cetera, that we'd be able to include that uh, in the evaluation. Again, making sure that we have enough time to be able to do it um, is, is, to me, more important than getting it back in a in a certain time frame because it's it's a lift. It, this is not a small study. Uh, this is not a small assessment, and there's a lot of pieces to this. Uh, so I think it's incumbent upon us to really do our due diligence and do uh, you know do effective uh, research to make the best recommendations for Vermonters to you all. Yeah, Representative Kopp, yeah, I echo what the Deputy Commissioner said. I think when I read this through, again, it's not really totally corrections as lane, right? It's it's more mental health lane, understanding the forensic piece. But what struck me again, I, I don't know about the Connecticut piece and exactly who the player should be around the table, but I do think it's such a large conversation that specific language helps focus the group early on. So you don't spend a lot of time early on just trying to figure out what what where the white lines are, right? I think for me, when I read through it, my sense of that was, okay, it's giving very clear directions on, you know, like like the deputy commissioner said, do we need it? What should it look like? Who, who should be involved in it? How are you going to fund it? Um, it's a big step forward, I think, when we start, as we've been saying today, about where we're going with that population that we run into every once in a while, that just, boom, it ends. And I, I think it's a big step and it's an important step. One, one uh, 
one group that I forgot to mention that I think should be a part of uh, um, this this working group. Uh, it, we have you know Attorney General's office, we have Defender General, states attorneys and sheriffs, uh, but judiciary um, I think uh, should be represented, uh, especially you know we're trying to talk about who this facility should serve, how they'll be served, you know, and some of those conditions. And I, so I think judiciary would be an important partner uh, to include in that. So we're scheduling time with you folks and more folks next week on section six. So I don't wanna take up too much time today to go into this too deep for this, cause I wanna start closing up on this. Yep. Um, so Sarah, were you finished? Yes, I was, and that's very helpful. Thank you. So Kurt, and I'm gonna have to scoot out quickly again just to pay my carpenter. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't carpentry worked on. I had trees uh, cut I, down yesterday. <laughs> um, my question uh, doesn't have to do with, I just have a question for the commissioner that's completely different topic, but while, I, while he's here, I wanted to ask him, but so I can wait until we're done with this. Okay. So any more questions on the forensic section six? Cause we're gonna go into a deeper dive with this next week for this, but I wanted to give the committee some kind of an overview of what we're dealing with a little bit with this. Anything else for folks? Okay, Kurt. Um, in the process of preparing for our discussion on um, Tuesday. Probation uh, on probation. I went through the a uh, lot of the GSC uh, presentations from the Council of State Governments, and in there there was mentioned um, the idea of having the at sentencing to have the judge have DOC provide a short report that um, talks about the the person being sentenced and to better uh, inform the care that or the programs that that person might need and what conditions of probation there might be. And at the time, um, Commissioner, I think you said that it sounded like a good idea, but you might think about a pilot study or something, a pilot of that, in, just to see how it works out and how much it would really impact uh, the resources of DOC. I'm wondering if that's, if that's still a good idea and it's something that uh, either you've done anything on or something that we should move on. I, I believe, and I'd, I'd have to get back with staff because I haven't been tracking this, but I believe that Director Dow Crook has been working uh, on a Senate bill that actually, that actually does that, um, sets up a pilot. I think what you're talking about is, is giving um, some type of report to the judge before the sentencing is what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. Right. I think yep. there's a pilot project in the works. I'd have to get caught up with Director Crook to fully understand it. But uh, I did get briefed on that last week, and that was moving forward. Okay, gonna, good. Thank gonna, you. It's gonna, I can. It's going to be a demonstration site project to see how it goes, and uh, I, I believe it's moving forward. If I'm not mistaken, that would be perfect. And and if he's back in the committee, I can ask him about it sometime too. So thank you. You're welcome. Dale will be back. He'll be in next week. Uh, Karen. Yes, it's funny that Representative Taylor brought that up because I had a sticky note. I was looking ahead on our house calendar um, and it looks like a, a Senate amendment is coming on the floor tomorrow that is specifically around this pilot. Um, and it's on H20 and it's um, a pilot for a pre-sentencing re report when probation is recommended for a felony um, to kind of confirm what the ideal probation conditions are. And it's saying it brings DOC, the courts, and um, state's attorney office and defender general together. And I was like, oh, well, that's an interesting amendment. And it seems like it affects our committee. So I think you're, things are moving quickly. Well, listen, Representative, you're better than I am because you're further up to speed on it. But that's, that's exactly where it is. It's on H20. It was an amendment added in the Senate. So that's exactly what's happening. We nailed it. So hopefully Representative Taylor had helped you. I'm going to have to get you a job as the commissioner of corrections there. So. I got you. Got you covered. So Dale's going to be in our com committee tomorrow after the floor to talk on the probation piece. And of course, this bill 
I don't know if it'll be up for action tomorrow or not because it's a Senate proposal of amendment, so we have to give time for judiciary to uh, act on it. And they may not be ready to act on it tomorrow. So we don't know. Anything else before we finish up here? Okay, well, thank you, Commissioner Baker and Deputy Commissioner Fox. And we'll see you more next week when we do a deeper dive on Section 6. Get um, out and enjoy the weather, folks. Yes. Get some sunshine and fresh air. That's what we're aiming for. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care. Have a good thank evening. Thank yes, you. you too. Okay. Um, phew. What a day, huh? So I think we're done. Um...